acne affects nearly 1 in 10 people in the world, making it perhaps the eighth most prevalent disease worldwide. What's the role of nutrition? Uh, well, go back a century, and dermatology textbooks were recommending various dietary restrictions. For example, recommending those with acne avoid foods like pork, sausage, cheese, pickles, pastries, sweets, cocoa, and chocolate. Yeah, but old-timey medicine was full of crackpot theories. Dr. Kellogg, for example, blamed acne on masturbation. Nothing a few cornflakes couldn't fix, though. Population studies have found associations between acne and the consumption of foods like dairy, sweets, and chocolate, but you don't know if it's cause and effect until you put it to the test. There have been high-quality reports like the Harvard Nurses Study that looked at nearly 50 thousand women, and found a link between adolescent milk drinking and acne, particularly skim milk, something that's been found for teenage boys as well. They thought it might be the hormones in milk that were responsible, but it could also be the milk protein whey, of which they add extra to skim milk to make it less watery, which may play a role directly in acne formation or as hormonal carriers. That would explain cases like this where whey protein powders were implicated in precipitating acne flares in teens who had acne that just didn't seem to want to go away, until they stopped the whey. It doesn't appear to just be a protein effect, since soy protein supplements, for example, did not seem to cause the same problem. But for dairy, in terms of interventional studies, all we have are these kinds of case series. If you do a systematic review of acne and nutrition, you get results like this for dairy. Out of the 20 or so papers on acne and dairy out there, about three-quarters suggest adverse effects, and the remainder report no effect, with no study suggesting a beneficial effect of dairy on acne. So you could look at this and conclude a dairy-free diet is worth a try, but this is based on low-grade evidence, uh, level C and D evidence, where C is like the population studies, and D are like those uh, series of case reports. Uh, what we want ideally are randomized, interventional studies, uh, level A and B evidence, which we don't have for dairy, but we do have for chocolate. When it comes to acne, no food is more universally condemned than chocolate. So if you're the Chocolate Manufacturers Association, how are you going to design a study to make your product not look so bad? Well, you can always use the old drug company trick of pitting your product against something even worse, and so they fit people chocolate bars versus fake chocolate bars made out of a partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, trans fats. Uh, so you make it have more sugar, throw in some milk protein, and make it 28% pure trans fat-laden Crisco-like vegetable shortening. And surprise, surprise, there were just as many pimples on the fake chocolate bars, allowing them to conclude that eating high amounts of chocolate is A-OK -okay when it comes to acne. And the medical community fell for it. Have we been guilty of taking candy away from babies? Too many patients harbor the delusion that their health can somehow be mysteriously harmed by something in their diet. That original study, finding that chocolate consumption supposedly does not exacerbate acne, has continued to remain virtually unchallenged for decades, and continues to be cited even in recent reviews. For example, this pediatrics journal. Years ago, it was demonstrated that chocolate consumption has no effect on acne. This serves as a cautionary example of how research-based evidence should be vigorously scrutinized prior to being incorporated into clinical practice. Just because something is published in the Journal of the American Medical Association doesn't necessarily mean it's a good study, especially when industry interests are involved. Maybe we should be telling acne patients to try cutting down on not only the sweets and the dairy, but also the trans fats found in partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. But we can't be unequivocal in our advice to acne sufferers on foods to include or exclude until they're put to the test in well-designed, randomized, controlled clinical trials. But there simply weren't any such trials on acne until now.
A century ago, dye was commonly used as part of the treatment for acne. During the 1960s, however, the diet-acne connection fell out of favor. Why? Because of a study purported to prove that chocolate had no influence on acne by comparing a chocolate bar to a pseudo-chocolate bar, composed of 28% pure trans fat-laden, partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, a substance known to increase signs of inflammation. Compared to that, no wonder the chocolate didn't come out looking so bad. And then there was this other study, where small groups of medical students ate a variety of purported culprits, and only about a third broke out. Uh, but there was no control group to compare to. Yet these two studies, despite their major design flaws, were sufficient to dissociate diet from acne in the minds of most dermatologists. Uh, textbooks were revised to reflect this new academic consensus, and dermatologists took the stance that any mumblings about the association between diet and acne were unscientific, and one of the many myths surrounding this ubiquitous disease. Comments such as, the association of diet with acne has been relegated to the category of myth are commonplace in both the past and current medical literature. Yet the major dermatology textbooks promulgating this notion that diet and acne are unrelated rely only on those two flawed studies. So this current thought within the dermatology community that diet and acne are unrelated has little or no factual support and there's reason to suspect chocolate consumption may be an issue. If you take blood from people before and after eating a couple bars of milk chocolate, it appears to prime some of your pus cells to release extra inflammatory chemicals when you expose them to acne-causing bacteria in a Petri dish. Uh, so maybe this is one of the mechanisms that could explain the effects of chocolate on acne. But how do we know it's the chocolate and not the added sugar or milk? Yes, if you survey teens on their acne severity and eating habits, there appears to be a link to chocolate consumption. But is that people sprinkling cocoa powder in their smoothies, or eating dark chocolate, or is it because they added sugar and milk? Just cutting down on sugary foods and refined grains can cut pimple counts in half in a few months significantly better than the control group, complete with compelling before and after pictures. To tease out if it was the sugar, researchers gave people milk chocolate versus jelly beans. If it was just the sugar, then acne would presumably get equally worse in both groups. But instead, the chocolate group got worse, a doubling of acne lesions, whereas no change in the jelly bean group. So it's apparently not just the sugar. Uh, maybe there is something in chocolate, or is it only in milk chocolate? So far, there have been no studies assessing the effects of pure 100% chocolate on acne. That is, until there were. 57 volunteers with mild to moderate acne were randomized into three groups, receiving white chocolate bars, dark chocolate bars, or no chocolate bars every day for a month. And this wasn't just dark chocolate, but 100% chocolate, meaning like baker's chocolate. Unlike pure dark chocolate, white chocolate is packed with sugar and milk, and indeed acne lesions worsened in the white chocolate group, but not in the dark chocolate or control groups. So in this study, white but not dark chocolate consumption was associated with an exacerbation of acne lesions. But other studies did show acne worsening on dark chocolate, uh, give research subjects a single big load of Girardelli baking chocolate, and they broke out within days. A significant increase in the total average number of acne lesions within four days. And same thing with more chronic dark chocolate consumption. A half a small chocolate bar a day for a month, and increased acne severity was reported within two weeks with before and after pictures looking like this. OK, but what was lacking in these two studies? Give people chocolate every day and their acne gets worse, or one big load of chocolate and their acne gets worse. What didn't these studies include? Long-time Nutrition Facts followers should know this by now. Right, they're missing a control group. If you look at surveys, most people believe chocolate causes acne. So if you give people a big load of chocolate, maybe just the stress and expectation that they're going to have an outbreak contributes to the actual outbreak. Uh, to really get to the bottom of this, you'd have to design a study where you give people disguised chocolate. You expose people to chocolate without them knowing it and see if they still break out. Uh, 
like you could put uh, cocoa powder into opaque capsules so they don't know if they're getting cocoa or placebo, and that would have the additional benefit of eliminating the cocoa butter fat factor. No milk, no sugar, no fat, just pure cocoa powder in capsules versus placebo. Uh, but there's never been such a study until now. A double-blind, placebo-controlled study assessing the effects of chocolate consumption, actually cocoa powder consumption, in subjects with a history of acne. Assigned to swallow capsules filled with either unsweetened 100% cocoa or a placebo of like an unflavored unsweetened jello powder. Uh, just a one time binge requiring the swallowing of up to 240 capsules to try to secretly expose people to a few ounces of cocoa powder, and the same significant increase, the same doubling of acne lesions within four days, like in the Girardelli study. So sadly, it really does appear that in acne-prone individuals, the consumption of cocoa may cause an increase in acne. Now, the study did just include men, so they didn't have to deal with cyclical hormonal changes, and it's hard to imagine that the real cocoa group, after swallowing hundreds of capsules, didn't like burp up some cocoa taste and know they were not just in the placebo group. But the best available balance of evidence does suggest that if you're bothered by acne, you may want to try backing off on chocolate to see if your symptoms improve. Lead poisoning still occurs in the United States, despite extensive prevention efforts and strict regulations. Ayurvedic supplements, for example, specifically marketed to pregnant women, exceeded safety levels by up to 4 million percent, making Ayurvedic medicine use and lead poisoning a continued concern in the United States. Heavy metals are intentionally added to the supplements, but don't worry, Ayurvedic practitioners claim, the lead has been detoxified with cow pee. Calcium supplements can be an additional source of lead contamination, something we've known for about a half a century now. Calcium supplements made from bone may have the highest lead levels, but just regular calcium supplements were found contaminated too, including a number of big national brands. Diet-wise, the greatest contributor to lead intake of children and their parents may be dairy, but the most concentrated source may be wild game shot with lead-containing ammunition. Concerns have been raised by hunters, though, that lead-free bullets wouldn't have the same wounding capacity, but CT scans of kills show just as much damage is inflicted demonstrating that lead-free bullets have equivalent killing effectiveness even against ballistic soap, which evidently has a similar density to vital organs. Workers in like battery plants can be exposed to a lot of lead, but the number one non-occupational lead exposure is shooting firearms, uh, not eating lead-laden meat, just target practice in indoor firing ranges. 75% of target shooters have elevated lead levels in their blood. Even outside, airborne lead released by the friction of the bullet against the barrel, or lead-containing primers, can lead to substantial lead exposure both in the people and in local wildlife, as well as the soil, with lead levels higher than that found next to an industrial lead factory. Most lead in urban soil, though, is from the decades of lead paint and leaded gasoline, raising concerns about urban gardens. Most of the lead doesn't get taken up by the plants, though, but can stick to the leaves and roots. This is bad news in that even crops from raised beds using clean soil may get contaminated in an urban environment, but the good news is that the lead can presumably just be washed off. The health benefits of gardening and fresh produce would likely more than compensate for the risk at most sites. Eggs from backyard chickens, however, should be tested for lead, since the lead gets inside the egg and so can't be washed off. Uh, most of the lead ends up in the bird's skeleton, though, which raises the question, what happens when you try to make chicken soup? 
There may be an upswing in people boiling bones due to encouragement from paleo diet advocates. The problem is that lead is a neurotoxin. And not just a neurotoxin, it adversely affects the bone marrow, and digestive tract, and kidneys, and circulatory system, and hormones, and reproduction. Symptoms of too much lead exposure include impaired cognition, anemia, abdominal pain, kidney problems, high blood pressure, miscarriages, memory problems, constipation, impotence, depression, poor concentration, etc. And we know from human studies that lead is sequestered in the bones. When there's a lot of lead turnover, like at menopause or during pregnancy, lead levels in the blood can go up. This bump can be minimized during pregnancy by getting enough calcium and lowering sodium intake. When astronauts lose bone in space, the lead is released into their bloodstream, but ironically, since they're no longer exposed to all the lead on Earth, their overall lead levels may go down. Bones are so good at sucking up lead, they can be like sprinkled on firing ranges to prevent lead from leaching further into the environment. So these researchers were concerned that the boiling of farm animal bones might release lead into the broth. So they made three types of organic chicken broth, one with the bones, one with just the meat, and one with the skin and cartilage. All the soups exceeded the maximum allowable dose level for lead, even the boneless. Surprisingly, the skin and cartilage was the worst, exceeding the safety level per one cup serving by like 475%. Aloe vera is one of the most popular home remedies in use today, yet most physicians know little about it. In fact, most dismiss it as useless, while their patients firmly believe in its healing properties. The usual tendency of most doctors is to dismiss as useless any popular remedy that can be purchased without a prescription. However, the aloe plant deserves a closer look, because, surprising as it may seem, uh, there may be a scientific basis for some of its uses. It has, after all, been used medicinally for thousands of years by a number of ancient civilizations. Only recently, though, has it been put to the test. But the tests have been like finding out if you can use aloe to ameliorate the damage of albino rat testicles, or affecting the cholesterol and estrogen responses in juvenile goldfish. Yes, if you inject aloe into the bloodstream of rats, their blood pressure drops, but if you feed it to people, it doesn't appear to have any blood pressure-lowering effect. In rats, drinking aloe causes colorectal tumors to form, whereas it appears to have anti-inflammatory effects on human intestinal lining in a petri dish. But when you put it to the test for irritable bowel syndrome, no benefit was found for improving symptoms or quality of life in IBS patients. What about IBD, inflammatory bowel disease? No benefit found there either. What about the beneficial effects of aloe in wound healing? Evidently so miraculous as to seem more like myth than fact. Works when you slice open guinea pigs, or when you try to frost bite off the ears of bunny rabbits, but in people may make things worse, aloe causing a delay in wound healing. 21 women were studied who had wound complications after having a cesarean or other abdominal surgery, healing on their own in an average of 53 days, whereas the wounds treated with aloe vera gel required 83 days, 50% longer. They thought it would help based on the animal research, but when put to the test in people, it failed. At this point in my research, it was looking like the only benefit to aloe was to improve the quality of cheap beef burgers. But what about burns? Aloe has been used to treat burns since antiquity, but in their ageless wisdom, they were also applying excrement to burns, so I wouldn't put too much faith in ancient medical traditions. That's why we have science. Uh, what's the effectiveness of aloe vera gel compared with uh, silver sulfadiazine as burn wound dressings in second-degree burns? 
The introduction of topical antimicrobial agents has resulted in a significant reduction in burn mortality, and the most commonly used is this silver sulfadiazine. Unfortunately, it may delay wound healing and become toxic to the kidneys and bone marrow, so they tried it head-to-head -head against topical aloe gel, and the aloe burns healed 50% faster, and the pain went away about 30% quicker. The researchers conclude that aloe has remarkable efficacy in the treatment of burn injuries. Anyone see the flaw in that logic, though? What was this study missing? Right, a placebo control group. Why? Because I just told you that one of the side effects of the drug is delayed wound healing. Uh, so maybe the aloe worked better just because it wasn't delaying healing, uh, but wouldn't have worked better than just nothing. When put to the test against nothing, aloe vera and Vaseline versus the Vaseline alone, the aloe really did seem to help, uh, speeding healing by about a third. And indeed, put all the studies together, and aloe does appear to significantly speed up the healing of secondary burns. OK, but blistering burns are thankfully less common than just like sunburns, where your skin just turns red. What is the efficacy of aloe vera in the prevention and treatment of sunburn? An aloe vera cream was applied 30 minutes before, immediately after, and both before and after, burning people with a UV lamp. And surprisingly, the aloe appeared to offer no sunburn protection and had no efficacy in sunburn treatment when compared to placebo. But hey, at least it worked for blistering burns, so should we keep some aloe vera gel in the medicine cabinet? The problem is that aloe vera at the store may have no aloe vera at all. Oh, they say they have aloe vera as the first or second ingredient, but are apparently lying. See, there's no watchdog assuring that aloe products are what they say they are. That means suppliers are on an honor system, and when health and nutrition are mixed with profit, honor too often goes out the window. Regular apple intake is associated with all sorts of good things, like living longer, particularly a lower risk of dying from cancer. Here's the survival curve of elderly women who don't eat an apple a day. Ten years out, nearly a quarter died, and 15 years out, nearly half were gone. But those who averaged like a half an apple a day didn't drop off as fast, and those eating an apple a day, more than three and a half ounces, like a cup of apple slices, stayed around even longer. Yeah, but maybe people who eat apples every day just happen to practice other healthy behaviors, like exercising more or not smoking, and that's really why they're living longer. Well, they controlled for most of that obesity, smoking status, poverty, diseases, exercise, so as to compare apples to apples, so to speak. But what they didn't control for was an otherwise healthier diet. Studies show that those who regularly eat apples have higher intakes of not just nutrients like fiber found in the apples, but they're eating less added sugar, less saturated fat. In other words, they're eating overall healthier diets, and so no wonder apple eaters live longer. But is apple eating just a marker for healthy eating, or is there something about the apples themselves that's beneficial? You don't know until you put it to the test. There's all sorts of fun studies like this, where subjects were randomly assigned in the morning to nothing, a caffeinated energy drink, black coffee, or an apple, uh, given that athletes use a variety of common strategies to stimulate arousal, cognition, and performance before their morning training. Did the apple hold its weight? Yes, appearing to work just as well as the caffeinated beverages. Uh, the problem with these kinds of studies, though, is they're not blinded. Uh, those in the apple group knew they were eating an apple, and so uh, there may have been this expectation bias, placebo effect, that made them unconsciously give that extra bit of effort in the testing and skew the results. You just can't stuff a whole apple into a pill. That's why researchers instead test specific extracted apple components so they can perform a double-blind placebo-controlled study where half get the fruit elements, half get the sugar pill, and you don't know until the end who got which. The problem there, though, is that you're no longer dealing with a whole food, uh, removing the symphony of interactions between the thousands of phytonutrients in the whole apple. Most of these special nutrients are concentrated in the peel 
Though, instead of just dumping millions of pounds of nutrition in the trash, why couldn't researchers just dry and powder the peels into opaque capsules to disguise them, and then run blinded studies with that? Even just a small amount could greatly increase phytochemical content and antioxidant activity. The meat industry got the memo. Dried apple peel powder decreases microbial expansion in meat and protects against carcinogen production when you cook it. And one of the carcinogens formed during the grilling of meat is a beta-carbolane alkaloid, a neurotoxin, which may be contributing to the development of neurological diseases like Parkinson's. I did a video about it a while ago. Uncooked meat doesn't have any. The neurotoxin is formed when you cook it, but you can cut the levels in half by first marinating the meat with dried apple peel powder and also cuts down the amount of fecal contamination bacteria in the meat, fecal bacteria growing before and after the addition of dried apple peel powder in pork, beef, and turkey. Apple peels can also inhibit the formation of genotoxic, DNA-damaging heterocyclic amines, cutting the effects of these cooked meat carcinogens by up to more than half. In view of the risks associated with consuming these cancer-causing compounds in meat, there is a need to reduce exposure by blocking HA formation, such as adding apple powder during the cooking of meats to help prevent their production. I mean, I can't think of any other way to reduce exposure. What about consuming apple peels directly? Dried apple peel powder was found to exhibit powerful anti-inflammatory and antioxidant action, but this was in mice. Does it have anti-inflammatory properties in people? You don't know until you put it to the test. A dozen folks with moderate loss of joint range of motion and associated chronic pain were given a spoonful of dried apple peels a day for 12 weeks, and pain scores dropped month after a month, and the range of motion improved in their neck, shoulders, back, and hips. Conclusion. Consumption of dried apple peel powder was associated with improved joint function and pain reduction. Why just associated? Because there was no control group, so they might have all been just getting better on their own, or it could have been a placebo effect, but hey, why not give apple peels a try by eating more apples? We've known about the possible association between the consumption of alcohol with excessive mortality from cancer for more than a hundred years, though the evidence is accumulating that alcohol drinking is also associated with pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, and melanoma. We're pretty certain that alcohol increases risk of mouth cancer, throat cancer, esophageal cancer, colorectal cancer, liver cancer, voice box cancer, and breast cancer. Current estimates suggest that alcohol causes about 5.8% of all cancer deaths in these organs worldwide. Here's how that breaks down for men and women. In men, alcohol causes mostly head and neck cancers and gastrointestinal cancers, whereas it's mostly breast cancer in women. Alcohol appears to cause more than 100,000 cases of breast cancer every year. Yeah, but is that just among heavy drinkers? No, all levels of evidence shows a risk relationship between alcohol consumption and the risk of breast cancer, even at low levels of consumption. Now, eating a healthy diet may help modulate that risk. Yeah, alcohol increases the risk of breast cancer, but a fiber-rich diet may have the opposite effect. And so eating more whole plant foods may be able to help ease the adverse effects of alcohol. Alcohol has been shown to increase sex hormone levels like estrogen, which may increase breast cancer risk, but you see the opposite happening, eating fiber-rich foods. Fiber appears to bind estrogen in the colon, help flush it out of the body. But even so, there does not appear to be any level of alcohol consumption that is completely safe from a cancer standpoint. So that's why you see commentaries like this in the medical literature, exclamation point and all, that consumption of an addictive carcinogen cannot be considered a healthy lifestyle choice. Thus, the final message on alcohol should be clear. It is toxic, carcinogenic, birth defect causing, and potentially addictive. By arguing otherwise, scientists can give the alcohol lobby and advertisers the opportunity to manipulate the scientific evidence to place profits over public health. They do this through denying the evidence, distorting the evidence, and trying to distract the public's attention. 
the alcohol industry, Big Booze, appears to be engaged in the same kind of extensive misrepresentation of the evidence for which Big Tobacco is best known. Yet they're able to maintain this illusion of righteousness. Alcohol, tobacco, and junk food companies increasingly seek to present themselves as objective providers of health information about their products. But health information should come from health authorities, not the 21st century's most successful drug peddlers. Alcohol industries profit hugely from this disconnect, though, and sometimes even appropriate the cause of cancer prevention in order to promote their carcinogenic product. Case in point, Mike's Hard Pink Lemonade. Join the fight drink pink carcinogens, associating the creation of their pink ribboned alcohol with the death of one of its employees from breast cancer, ironically contributing to risk in the name of prevention. Who, after all, can forget Kentucky Fried Chicken's Buckets for the Cure campaign? Cancer risk is one of the things the alcohol industry won't tell you, but why doesn't your doctor tell you? There's relatively little public awareness of the link, and the medical community has largely remained silent. The medical profession may be getting more hip to corporate conflicts of interest in general, but why are we ignoring the alcohol industry? In other words, why is alcohol cancer's best-kept secret? Maybe it's because the doctors are drinkers themselves, and swan to remain in denial over the whole thing. Not only do most doctors drink, a significant proportion admit to drinking while on call, and report encountering fellow physicians who are on call who are apparently impaired, even though most doctors felt they had an obligation to tell their patients should such a situation arise, guess how many actually do? Only 12% reported that they informed their patients they'd been drinking. The industry has identified the alcohol-causes-cancer message as a considerable threat. They have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo of relative ignorance, uncertainty, and denial among the general population and their trusted health advisors. In the face of this, it is time that health professionals set aside any leanings that might stem from their own drinking and convey unreservedly to their patients and the communities they serve that alcohol causes cancer. Yeah, alcohol is a neurotoxin, which can cause brain damage. Yeah, alcohol can cause cancer. And so perhaps the consumption of alcohol cannot be considered a healthy lifestyle choice since it's an addictive carcinogen and all. But cancer is only killer number two. Killer number one is heart disease. And so what about the French paradox? Doesn't moderate drinking protect against cardiovascular disease? As I've explained before, there apparently is no French paradox. It seems to have all just been a scam. But that's what started the whole resveratrol fiasco. One episode on 60 Minutes suggesting the red wine component resveratrol might account for the French paradox, and research took off. Even after it turned out there was no French paradox, research continued unabated, culminating in 10,000 scientific publications to date. And what did they find? After more than 20 years of well-funded research, resveratrol has no proven human activity. One salient theme that consistently arises throughout this voluminous body of work underscores the fact that data from human studies is sorely lacking, despite resveratrol's popularity as a dietary supplement. The hype in the popular media regarding resveratrol may indeed turn out to be nothing more than a sleight-of-hand marketing device using non-human research as a cover. When you see graphics like this, they're based on laboratory animal studies at massive doses, tens of milligrams per pound. And so if you do the math, that's where so-called experts arrive at suggestions for a gram a day for people. OK, so how much red wine do you have to drink to get that much? Oh, just like 5,000 cups a day, or a couple thousand gallons of white wine a day, or 5,000 pounds of apples or grapes, maybe 50,000 pounds of peanuts. That is one big PB&J. A couple thousand pounds of chocolate. Start out with a million bottles of beer on the wall. Of course, it doesn't help matters when a leading resveratrol researcher is found guilty of 145 counts of 
fabrication and falsification of data, throwing the whole field into turmoil. Wine may only be good, this translates to, for those who sell it. The resveratrol fiasco is not the only time dietary supplements have failed to fulfill their promise. Notable examples include beta-carotene pills and fish oil capsules, where you know, studies in the 90s showed taking beta-carotene in pill form actually increased cancer risk. And in 2013, the shift on fish oil supplements from no proof of effectiveness to proof of no effectiveness. The main lesson being that what makes biological sense and works in test tubes and lab rats does not always operate in humans. After all, resveratrol is only one of tens of thousands of components identified. Uh, thinking in terms of whole foods may be a better approach for health and disease prevention. Uh, like instead of one chemical in wine extracted from grapes, how about just eating the whole grape? For the prevention of diseases, the whole dietary grape seems to be the best-case scenario. Why do we not see the corporate interests of the alcohol industry as clearly as we see those of the tobacco industry? Well, the alcohol industry has waged a sophisticated and successful campaign over the last few decades, undermining perceptions of the extent of alcohol-related harm to health by framing the argument as a balance of benefits and harms. Yes, alcohol may be an intoxicating carcinogen, increasing cancer risk, but what about reducing heart disease risk? Policymakers hesitate to introduce effective alcohol policies or even to support the addition of warning labels for fear they might undermine or contradict any possible health benefits of alcohol use. After all, alcohol consumption clearly raises HDL, the supposed good cholesterol. But sadly, as I've already explored, HDL is no longer considered protective, uh, based in part on so-called Mendelian randomization studies, where having a high HDL your whole life doesn't appear to help, uh, whereas a lifelong reduction of bad cholesterol, LDL, just thanks to luck-of-the-draw genetics, does indeed decrease heart disease risk. So the boost in HDL from alcohol may not matter. And if you look at subclinical markers of atherosclerosis, like the thickening of the wall of your carotid arteries in your neck, those that abstain from alcohol completely seem to be at the lowest risk. And the same with coronary calcium scores, where in general the lower the alcohol consumption, the lower the risk. And alcohol bumps our blood pressure up a bit as well, which would be expected to raise, not lower, our cardiac risk. So where do we get this idea that alcohol was good for us? from the famous J-curve. Check it out. If you follow large populations of people over time in general, the more people drink, the higher their risk of dying prematurely. But the lowest risk, those who tend to live the longest, were not those who drank zero, uh, the abstainers, but those who drank moderately, like one drink a day. That's why you get some folks recommending that physicians should counsel lifelong non-drinkers to take up the habit. Sure, there are statin drugs, but alcoholic beverages don't require a prescription, are far cheaper, and certainly more enjoyable. Is moderate drinking really protective? Or is there just something about people who abstain completely from alcohol that puts them in a higher risk category? The reason we suspect something fishy is going on is that abstainers seem to be at higher risk of a whole swath of diseases, including, ironically, liver cirrhosis. Compared to lifelong abstainers, those who have never touched the stuff, men and women drinking a little appear to have less liver cirrhosis. Wait, what? How could a little drinking be linked to lower rates of liver cirrhosis? Well, let's think about it. What makes more sense, that drinking led to less liver cirrhosis, or liver cirrhosis led to less drinking? In other words, reverse causation, the so-called sick-quitter effect. Um, if you look at studies of smokers, sometimes you see higher mortality rates among those who quit smoking compared to those who continue smoking. Why? Because the reason they quit smoking is because they got sick. So of course, sick people die more often than less sick people. That's why when you classify someone as a non-smoker in a study, you have to make sure they're a lifelong non-smoker, not just a non-smoker since last Tuesday. Yet, unbelievably, that's not what they do in most alcohol studies, where instead they misclassify former drinkers as if they were lifelong abstainers. 
And look, individuals with poorer health are more likely to cut down or stop drinking completely, thereby making current drinkers look good in comparison to those who drink zero, because some of the abstainers are just abstaining because they got sick and stopped. OK, so what if you went back to all those studies and corrected the misclassification, separate out the former drinkers from the lifelong abstainers? We didn't know until now. They indeed found drinker misclassification errors all too common, plaguing three-quarters of the studies, and when they controlled for that, the jade curve disappeared the death versus alcohol relationship became more consistent with a straight line you know, linear dose response, meaning more alcohol, more death, no protection at low levels of consumption. So no apparent benefit of light to moderate drinking after all when you use better comparison groups. Although these results are not what the majority of drinking adults may desire to believe, the public deserves to hear and to read in a more complete and balanced detail the ever-growing evidence that drinking alcohol is very unlikely to improve their health. Once you remove from studies on alcohol and mortality the systematic error of misclassifying former drinkers as if they were lifelong abstainers, Moderate alcohol consumption, like a glass of wine a day, does not appear to be protective after all. The immediate implication from this new research is that clinicians need to be highly skeptical about the hypothesized health benefits of alcohol consumption and should not advise their patients to drink to improve their life expectancy. This is especially important given increasing awareness of cancer risk from even moderate alcohol use. Given the cancer risk, if there's just harms and no benefits, then the ideal alcohol intake on a routine day-to-day -day basis should really be zero, potentially making it a red light beverage. The problem was that many of these population studies classified those that quit drinking in response to ill health as non-drinkers. This is the problem of reverse causation. Instead of abstaining leading to poor health, poor health may have led to abstaining. It's like when studies show those who sit around and watch TV have worse health. Is more TV leading to illness, or is illness leading to more TV on the couch? That's one of the reasons why if you look at the hierarchy of evidence, where higher on the period means stronger evidence, interventional trials, like randomized control trials, tend to offer better evidence than observational studies of populations which can suffer from both reverse causation and confounding factors. For example, light drinkers as a group may be more likely to drink their glass of wine with a salad than a cheeseburger, and that's why the wine appeared protective. But sometimes it's hard to do randomized control trials. Like, you can't randomize people to smoke a pack a day for a few decades, and so sometimes you have to base your decisions on observational studies. But now we have a new tool, Mendelian randomization. In cases where randomized control trials are not feasible or practical, this new tool can provide reliable evidence on the cause and effect relationship between exposures and risks of disease. It's like the HDL story. Alcohol does raise your HDL good cholesterol levels, but unfortunately it seems good cholesterol isn't any good at lowering heart disease risk after all, based in part on Mendelian randomization studies, where people who are randomly assigned higher HDL levels genetically from birth don't appear to be protected. Is there any way to study people who are randomly assigned since conception to not drink as much? Remarkably, yes. Alcohol is detoxified in the liver to carbon dioxide and water by two enzymes, but in the process a toxic intermediate metabolite is produced called acetaldehyde, which can cause unpleasant nausea and flushing sensation. So if people are born with a slow variant of this enzyme, or a superfast variant of this enzyme, Acetaldehyde can build up, making alcohol drinking in these people a relatively unpleasant experience throughout their lives. So they're just born less likely to drink as much. So do they have increased risk of heart disease, like the original observational studies would suggest? No, they have reduced risk of heart disease. This suggests that reduction of alcohol consumption, even for light to moderate drinkers, is beneficial for cardiovascular health. 
So this just sheds further doubt on the protective association between moderate alcohol consumption and heart disease, which was already plagued with the confounding and bias, and now the scientific pillars on which it's based appear increasingly shaky, leading some to suggest the leaning tower of presumed health benefits from moderate alcohol use has finally collapsed. Given the harms attributed to alcohol use, it's not surprising that reports suggesting benefits attracted enthusiasm among consumers, the media, and of course the alcohol industry. But these apparent benefits are now evaporating. What conclusion should we draw from this emerging evidence? First, in health as elsewhere, if something looks too good to be true, like butter is back, it should be treated with great caution. Uh, secondly, health professionals should discourage drinking. Thirdly, health advice should come from health authorities, not from the alcohol industry, which should remove all misleading references to purported health benefits, which are increasingly looking more like a triumph of spin doctoring than good science. As contrived as the alleged split among scientists over climate change advanced by the petroleum industry. As an intoxicating, addictive, toxic, carcinogenic drug, alcohol is not a great choice as a therapeutic agent, e even if it did help. There are better ways to prevent heart attacks, namely diet and exercise, and drugs when necessary. In contrast to that of alcohol, effectiveness of lifestyle interventions has been demonstrated, and as a bonus, has no abuse potential. There's a reason there's no Appleholics Anonymous. What is behind the dramatic increase in dementia in Japan over recent decades? Uh, maybe it's rising obesity rates, or the increases in cholesterol-saturated fat and iron from increases in animal products and meat. Overall, calories just went up about 10% in Japan, whereas animal fat and meat consumption rose 500%, about 10 times the rise in sugary junk. Now, during this time span, rice consumption went down, but the thinking is that rather than white rice somehow being protective, maybe they were just eating something worse instead. Uh, it's like when you, you know, find fish consumption is correlated with less disease. You wonder if it's because they're eating that rather than some worse meat. If you look across multiple countries, you see a similar pattern, with the most important dietary link to Alzheimer's appearing to be meat consumption with eggs and high-fat dairy also maybe contributing. Uh, there appears to be a really tight correlation between Alzheimer's and per capita meat supply. And then studies within countries uncover similar findings with Alzheimer's and cognitive decline associated with meaty, sweetie, fatty diets, whereas most plant foods were associated with risk reduction. Um, this could be for a variety of reasons. Animal products tend to have more copper, mercury, lead, cadmium, no folate, but contain saturated fat and cholesterol, and pro-inflammatory advanced glycation end products so many mechanisms that dietary modification may be our best bet for reducing risk of Alzheimer's disease. But how do we know its cause and effect? The evidence that meat consumption is causally linked to Alzheimer's disease, well, there's the strength of the association, the consistency across different types of studies, the fact that the dietary changes preceded the risk of dementia, the dose response, more meat linked to more risk, a bunch of plausible mechanisms. We know meat is a risk factor for other chronic diseases, but there's never been a randomized controlled trial to put it to the test. When you read reviews of the damaging effects of high-fat diets to the brain and cognition, a number of factors are proposed to account for the high-fat diet-induced damage to the brain, oxidative stress, insulin resistance, inflammation, and changes to blood vessels of the integrity of the blood-brain barrier. But these are based mostly on studies of rodents. Yes, high-fat diets can cause energy dysfunction in the brain, based on fancy MRI techniques, but if you're looking at that thinking, that's so weird-looking brain, that's because those are rat brains. Let me show you two sets of human cerebral arteries, the arteries deep inside your skull. These are the brain arteries on autopsy of non-demented elderly individuals. Here are the arteries from Alzheimer's patients, clogged nearly completely shut with atherosclerotic plaque packed with fat and cholesterol. With CT scans, you can follow this intracranial artery stenosis, this brain artery clogging over time, and follow the progression from mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease. 
those who only had low-grade stenosis were pretty stable over time in terms of their cognitive function and ability to dress themselves in other activities of daily living, whereas those with more clogging started slipping over the years, and those who started out with the most brain atherosclerosis rapidly went downhill, and twice as likely to progress to full-blown Alzheimer's. Chronic consumption of standard Western diets enriched in saturated fat and cholesterol may compromise our cerebrovascular integrity, compromise the blood vessels in our brain. Um, so, of course, drugs are recommended. Pharmacological modulation of diet-induced dysfunction, but why not just try to eat healthier in the first place? Environmental risk factors, meaning non-genetic risk factors, may play a significant role in autism, uh, given the fact that even identical twins that share the same DNA may not share the disease more than half the time. A variety of risk factors have been proposed. Lead, mercury, persistent organic pollutants like PCBs, or birth complications might cause a uh, pro-inflammatory state and oxidative damage in the brain. But what's that based on? You see a lot of correlational studies like this speculating about the possibility that one of the hidden agents spurring the rise in autism is something within the food supply, especially industrialized meat production, particularly poultry, based on the fact that the rise in poultry consumption, particularly parental poultry consumption, appeared to correlate with the rise in autism. Uh, they suggest it's the massive contamination of meat with antibiotics and growth hormones and toxic pollutants such as dioxin in the meat. There's certainly toxicological issues associated with meat production, uh, not just the pollutants, but the cooked meat carcinogens, leukotoxins. This review in the journal Meat Science came up with a whole list. But if anything, the main chronic toxic response of consuming meat and meat products is cancer, not autism. There's tons of confounding factors that could explain this correlation. Same thing with fish consumption and autism. On a state-by-state -state level, mercury-related fish advisories were found to be a surprisingly strong predictor of autism rates, suggesting that mercury-contaminated fish was to blame. But how many people tend to even eat the fish from their own state? Uh, that in no way proves a cause-and-effect mercury-autism connection. Why would they even think to make that connection? Well, heavy metals like mercury and lead do cause brain damage, and there's some similarities in terms of the symptoms they can cause, but don't really know until you put it to the test. Urine mobilization test, challenge test, or provoked urine test are all terms used to describe the administration of a chelating agent, uh, a heavy metal binding agent, to a person prior to the collection of their urine to test to see the level of heavy metal burden within their bodies. But pediatric public health and toxicology authorities recommend against the use of these tests, based on a lack of scientific validation and a lack of demonstrated benefits to the patients. Usually promoted by alternative practitioners as the basis for recommending, promoting, and selling to the patient questionable and often inappropriate therapies supposedly aimed at detoxification. Despite this disapproval, the tests are still commonly used and recommended by some practitioners. This is what the results end up looking like. Uh-oh, looks like mercury is in the red. It's easy for uninformed patients and providers to infer that a result that falls on the yellow or red background signifies heavy metal poisoning, but that's because they're not reading the fine print. That reference interval, that normal green range, is the level under non-provoked conditions, meaning normal urine, not urine from someone who has just given a chelating drug to provoke the response to intentionally grab onto heavy metals in the body and pull them out into the urine. That's like giving someone a drug that raises their heart rate like a shot of adrenaline, then taking their pulse and being like, wow, you got an abnormally high heart rate, compared to other people who just got a shot of adrenaline. No, just compared to regular resting heart rate. Uh, well, duh. See, there's no established reference ranges for provoked urine samples, so they're using the wrong reference range, so we have no idea what the results mean. And given the potential harm of whatever treatment the practitioner then tries to sell you on, these tests should not be utilized. 
Most commonly, that treatment means chronic chelation therapy. A half million people with autism are subjected to chelation therapy in the U.S. every year, despite no clinical trial evidence suggesting there's any benefit. Why not just give it a try, though? Because there's potential for side effects like death. They're referring to this case, where doctors were like, oops, they just gave the wrong drug. Should have been given editate calcium disodium, not just straight editate disodium. But this may have been no accident. That's exactly what's recommended by leading chelation proponents. As such, it would have been surprising only if the practitioner had not chosen it. So this may not just be a simple matter of the wrong medication being administered. That may just be a distraction from the prospect that the killer was quackery. This is not to say that heavy metals aren't toxic. It's just that instead of trying to give people chelation drugs after the fact, we should try to not get exposed in the first place. Uh, for example, in this study, they compared the blood mercury levels of physicians who ate no fish compared to those who ate one or two servings a week compared to those who ate three or more. Here's where the three or more servings a week group started out. And after a single chelation drug dose, mercury levels dropped down to here but perhaps better to eat less fish or no fish at all. Avocados have been described as a major dietary source of antioxidants, and this may be true compared to much of the stuff people eat. But compared to other common fruits, avocados are not necessarily anything to write home about. They do, however, contain those two carotenoid I nutrients found in dark green leafy vegetables, lutein and zeaxanthin, which may explain why Mexican Americans tend to beat out other ethnicities. The critical carotenoids are concentrated in the darkest green flesh close to the peel, and because of this, consumers should be advised to use the nick and peel method to obtain the nutrient-rich outer section of the avocado. The Tufts Nutrition and Health letter detailed what that means. You cut in half lengthwise around the seed, rotate a quarter turn, cut lengthwise again to make quarter avocado segments. Then you separate the quarters and remove the seed. And finally, starting from the tip, nick and carefully peel so as to not to lose that nutrient-rich darkest green flesh immediately under the skin. Avocados can also boost the absorption of the carotenoid phytonutrients in other vegetables because carotenoids like beta-carotene are fat-soluble. However, many of our best foods for obtaining carotenoids, like sweet potatoes, carrots, greens, contain very little fat. So if you eat them straight without any source of fat in your stomach, you may end up flushing a lot of that nutrition down the toilet. Remember, it's not what you eat, it's what you absorb. Here's the amount of beta-carotene that ends up in your bloodstream two, three, four, five, six hours after eating a little over a cup of salsa. There's a little bump. And the same thing with the red pigment lycopene. OK, but uh, now here's that same amount of salsa with an avocado added, tripling the absorption. That means if you eat tomatoes without some source of fat at the same meal, avocados or nuts and seeds, most of that bright red beautiful lycopene will end up in the toilet bowl rather than your bloodstream. Same thing eating a salad composed of lettuce, spinach, and carrots. With a fat-free dressing, hardly any beta-carotene makes it into your body. But add an avocado, and 15 times more beta-carotene ends up circulating throughout your body. Do you have to use a whole avocado, though? What about half an avocado? Pretty much same effect. Works just as well. What about a quarter of an avocado? We don't know the minimum amount of dietary fat required for optimum carotenoid absorption. It may just be a few grams per meal, though, in which case an eighth of an avocado would fit the bill, or just one or two walnuts. Interestingly, avocado consumption may not just enhance absorption of carotenoids, but then also enhance their subsequent conversion inside the body into vitamin A. People were given baby carrots with and without guacamole. And same thing we saw before, way more beta-carotene in the bloodstream in the hours following the meal with the guacamole added compared to the same amount of carrots alone. In fact, over six times more. And since beta-carotene is turned into vitamin A in the body, there should be six times more vitamin A too, right? No, they ended up with over 12 times more vitamin A. 
There was also a big increase in vitamin K levels, another fat-soluble vitamin, though that's partially because avocado contains vitamin K itself. Not too much, though, claims this avocado industry-sponsored review that people on the anticoagulant medication Coumadin have to worry. But that's not true. We've known for decades now that even though there's not an inordinate amount of vitamin K in avocados, it still interferes with the drug Coumadin, also known as warfarin though we're not exactly sure why. It may boost your liver's detoxifying enzymes or prevent absorption of the drug, but either way, those on the blood thinner Coumadin may want to put walnuts on their salad instead. Since the commercialization of marijuana in Colorado, its use among adolescents and young adults has increased significantly, up to a 50% increase reported in a single year. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, marijuana is not a benign drug for teens. The teen brain is still developing, and marijuana may cause abnormal brain development, which is why they and the Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry have officially opposed legalization. Whereas adult users appear comparatively immune to cannabis-induced long-term changes in brain function and structure, the same cannot be said of those starting during their early teens, when effects are both more severe and more long-lasting. During puberty, parts of the brain are actually reorganizing themselves, making this a vulnerable period. Remarkably, the brain does not complete development until approximately age 25. OK, but is this just reefer madness revisited? Show me the data. Yeah, studies of long-term heavy users tend to show they perform worse on various tests, but how do we know they weren't that way before they even started using? And then, of course, here you are demonstrating they have memory impairments, and yet you're relying on their answers in terms of when they started, how much they've smoked over the years. And so what you need are prospective longitudinal investigations, meaning following kids over time before and after to see what's really going on. Even better, you might think, would be a randomized controlled trial where you force half the kids to smoke, and even if that were ethical, it could merely show that cannabis has the potential to impair cognition. Only a prospective longitudinal study can really get at whether it's actually impairing brain function in the real world, and how much. This was the first study ever published. About 100 young adults assessed since infancy and after controlling for other factors like alcohol use and their brain function before they started smoking, the bad news is that they did find that regular heavy users did do significantly worse in terms of overall IQ, processing speed, and memory. But the good news was that the effects seemed to be temporary. The brains of those who smoked heavily but then stopped appeared to start functioning normally again after like three months. So yeah, if you're in school, of course, you, you want to function at your best, but at least there's no permanent brain damage, or so we thought. The average use of these former smokers was only about two years. Uh, they were testing them when they were about 18 years old. In this study, they didn't just follow 100 kids, but 1,000 from birth all the way to age 35. What did they find? They found that same decline in brain function, confirmed by reports of trusted friends and family, especially among those who started younger, but here's the kicker. Cessation of cannabis use did not fully restore brain function among those who started in their teens, even if they subsequently quit. So this suggests a true long-standing neurotoxic effect on the adolescent brain, which justifies why public health authorities are so concerned. And it was a global decline in mental function across all five tested domains— executive function, memory processing speed, perceptual reasoning, and verbal comprehensive— consistent with the thought that there's a critical brain development window that you just don't want to mess with. The decline in IQ, about six points, is the kind of brain damage you see with like low-level lead exposure, both of which are potentially preventable. But how? Do we need more DARE, drug abuse resistance education? Maybe, if it wasn't a complete failure. 
no beneficial effects in terms of changing drug use or even attitudes towards drug use, which appear to be getting more permissive over time, combined with earlier ages of initiation. And so increasing efforts should be directed towards delaying the onset of cannabis use by young people, at least until adulthood. Can the recreational use of marijuana cause cognitive impairment? Uh, yeah, that's kind of the whole point. Uh, people clearly do not use cannabis only for its harms. Like, what about boosting creativity? That's one of the reasons people smoke it. But you don't know until you put it to the test. They looked at divergent thinking, the ability to brainstorm creative solutions to problems, and at a dose people might typically use to get high, their creativity took a hit, too. So it may just be an illusion. People think they're more creative when they're high, but it may not be the best strategy, and even turn out to be counterproductive. For a few hours after smoking, one's learning, memory, and attention may also be impaired. But the question is, does it cause any lasting problems? In other words, is cannabis neurotoxic for a healthy brain? Researchers have found that cannabis users have a significantly smaller hippocampus, the memory center in the brain, compared to non-users. Yeah, but a snapshot in time study can never prove cause and effect. What you have to do is follow people over time. Only then can you see which came first. And what they found is both. There are pre-existing structural abnormalities in parts of the brain that control inhibitions and decision-making that may make someone more likely to take up the drug, but the shrunken hippocampus does seem a consequence of chronic cannabis exposure. OK, but is it permanent? There was a famous study published about pre-GPS London taxi drivers who spent literally years learning and memorizing how to navigate around the city, and they had hefty hippocampuses to prove it correlating to the amount of time spent as a taxi driver, suggesting the structure of the brain is in constant flux. So if you stop using marijuana, does your hippocampus grow back to full size? Researchers tested users six months after quitting and still found shrinkage, but what about years later? We didn't know until now. Yeah, hippocampal volume is reduced in long-term cannabis users, but this atrophy can be restored following prolonged abstinence. Even after 15 years of use, 29 months after quitting, the size of their hippocampus appeared to bounce back. And the same with cognitive impairments, gone within a month or two after stopping, unless you started regularly using as a teen. Those with most persistent cannabis use starting as an adolescent may end up losing up to 8 IQ points, significantly more than if they started as an adult. And even if they then quit, starting that young appears to cause permanent brain damage. But to get that lasting damage may require both adolescent onset and almost two decades of persistent use. Sounds like if you start using as an adult, though, there don't seem to be any irreversible neurological problems unless perhaps you smoke like 16 joints a day. In 2017, a study was published on extreme chronic and heavy cannabis use, and their poor brains really did seem to go to pot. Uh, long-lasting brain dysfunction in more than half, and even long-lasting psychotic symptoms, hallucinations, delusions, and not just memory problems, but like difficulty drawing basic figures. Uh, but again, this was at 10 times the average daily dose in Colorado, for example, a total lifetime consumption of around 75,000 joints. At present, we don't know precisely the degree to which the risk of cancer and other adverse health effects are increased by the exposure to the radio frequency fields from cell phones. I explored the brain tumor data previously. What other potential adverse health effects might there be? For example, what about the effect on brain function? The dramatic increase in the use of cell phones has generated concern about possible negative effects of the radio frequency signals delivered to the brain. 
However, whether acute cell phone exposure affects the human brain is unclear, so researchers decided to put it to the test using PET scan technology, and did find elevated brain activity in the region of the brain closest to the antenna after 50 minutes of exposure to a cell phone call. But what does that actually mean? Well, it's evidence that the human brain has at least some sensitivity to the effects of cell phone radiation. The increased metabolism in brain regions closest to the antenna, brain absorption of cell phone admissions, may enhance the excitability of brain tissue. The potential health consequences of this are unknown, noted the accompanying editorial, though suggests an effect on brain functioning is possible, potentially affecting neurotransmitter and neurochemical brain activities. Maybe that can explain the changes in psychological test outcomes observed after exposure to cell phone radiation. Wait, what? Earlier studies failed to find an effect of short-term cell exposure on human cognitive performance, but this 2017 review noted that several studies now indicate an increase in things like brain tissue excitability, which may translate out into measurable cognitive effects. This cortical excitability, excitability of the outer layer of the brain, might underpin disruptions in sleep tied to cell phone exposure, for example, but may also improve reaction time. If you expose people to active cell phones while playing like a computer game, they can actually respond faster compared to sham exposure, meaning like placebo exposure. Same scenario, but with the cell phone turned off. So the industry can be like, OK, OK, so cell phone radiation does affect brain function after all, but the effects are positive. A decrease in reaction time upon exposure to microwave radiation from cell phones can help people better respond to different threatening situations, decreasing errors perhaps, reducing destructive accidents. But the difference in reaction time was just a few thousandths of a second. Put all the studies together, the effects seem so small that implications for human performance in everyday life can be practically ruled out. There was a study that found that heavy cell phone users did better on a test of the ability to filter out irrelevant information, but this improvement in focused attention may just be because heavy cell phone users have lots of practice carrying on conversations in crowded places. Overall, electromagnetic fields from cell phones do not seem to induce cognitive or fine motor skill effects. Nonetheless, one has to worry about the existence of sponsorship and publication biases, meaning maybe studies funded by cell phone companies were designed in a way to skew the results, or were quietly shelved and never published if they showed anything negative. And indeed, if you compare the source of funding and results of studies of the health effects of mobile cell phone use, uh, studies funded exclusively by industry were substantially less likely to report significant health effects. It would look suspicious, though, if all the industry studies just showed no effects, so some have accused the industry of taking obfuscation to a new level. Although, yes, the industry-funded studies were significantly more likely to show no effects, as one might expect, no two studies reported the same effects, and the few attempts at replication failed. Thus, the apparent message of the studies dovetails well with the industry position that there are no reproducible biological effects. So they're not just denying the existence of effects. If the industry-funded studies all just universally found no effects, in contrast to independent research, the industry research program could have been more easily dismissed. Uh, of course, they all couldn't come out showing health effects. That would have been bad for business. So by instead coming up with this wide hodgepodge of conflicting results, they can better protect themselves, uh, perhaps all part of a well-designed legal strategy to fight off lawsuits, but we may never know. Uh, we do know that when the World Health Organization came out saying cell phones may be causing brain tumors, the cell phone industry went into damage control to attack the agency, similar to when the WHO came out against secondhand tobacco smoke. Sowing confusion and manufacturing doubt is just what industries tend to do. An assessment of websites on complementary and alternative medicine for cancer found that many endorse unproven therapies, and some that are outright dangerous, potentially exploiting highly vulnerable patients and enriching irresponsible snake oil peddlers. 
or for that matter, shark cartilage peddlers, accounting for millions of dollars of sales every year. Why shark cartilage, of all things? Interest in shark cartilage as an anti-cancer agent arose because many people believe that sharks did not get cancer. Why would they think such a thing? Because some shark cartilage supplement hawker wrote a book called Sharks Don't Get Cancer. But that's simply not true. Sharks do get cancer. Both benign and cancerous lesions have been reported in 21 species of sharks, more than nine families. For example, this oral tumor spilling out of the mouth of a great white. Now, some shark cartilage distributors insist instead that sharks just rarely get cancer, but actual cancer rates in sharks have never been determined. Uh, there's simply been no systematic tumor surveys of sharks for them to make such a claim. But look, even if sharks were less susceptible to cancer, how can one logically jump from that to cancer patients benefiting from eating powdered cartilage from a shark? We know, for example, that there are certain proteins that allow some bacteria to survive in like boiling hot springs. Uh, does that mean if we eat those bacteria we can survive boiling water too? It doesn't make any sense. The illogic behind the pursuit of shark cartilage therapies have implications beyond the reduction of shark populations and the misdirection of patients to ineffective cancer therapies. The stuff may be harmful. And I'm not just talking about the rare case of shark cartilage-induced liver inflammation. Shark products can contain the neurotoxin BMAA, which I've talked about before. It's been detected at elevated levels in the brains of Alzheimer's disease and ALS patients, and may play a role in the development of neurodegenerative disease. So like the consumption of shark fin soup or something may pose a significant health risk, but what about shark cartilage supplements? They tested 16 commercial shark cartilage supplements right off the shelves and found BMAA in 15 out of 16. But look, even if shark cartilage supplements carry pro-inflammatory properties, which could pose a potential health risk for consumers, uh, we're talking about cancer. There are chemotherapy agents that are life-threateningly dangerous, but sometimes the benefits can outweigh the risks when confronted with cancer. So the question then becomes, are there any benefits to shark cartilage? I mean, it's not a completely wacky idea. Cartilage in general is highly resistant to invasion by tumor cells. So maybe there's some cartilage-derived anti-invasion factor? Less interesting alternative explanations is that it's just hard for the cancer to penetrate the cartilage, or perhaps because of the poor blood supply in cartilage, cancer doesn't consider it a particularly fertile ground. But maybe that lack of blood vessels in cartilage can be exploited. The reason that no blood vessels end up in cartilage is because cartilage cells produce angiogenesis inhibitors, blood vessel creation inhibitors. And so maybe we can starve tumor growth by infusing these cartilage factors. What scientists do is implant tumors into the eyeballs of rabbits so they can visualize how many blood vessels the tumor is able to draw to itself. And indeed, shark cartilage contains inhibitors of tumor angiogenesis. Such findings made the sales of shark cartilage skyrocket, driving two shark species to the brink of extinction. But cow cartilage does the same thing. Here they used bovine cartilage, and so does human cartilage, for that matter. So why sell shark cartilage? Well, it does sound so much more exotic, and sharks have like 10 times more cartilage per animal. One 20-foot shark could dent like 50 pounds of cartilage. Just because cartilage has blood vessel inhibiting chemicals in it, though, doesn't mean if cancer patients eat it, it will help them. It's kind of like magical thinking. You know, shark cartilage stops blood vessel growth, thus by consuming shark cartilage, humans will somehow be protected. I mean, the shark cartilage protein molecules would seem to be too large to be absorbed by the gut. It's not like you're injecting shark cartilage into your bloodstream through an IV. But there was this rat study that did find that just feeding shark cartilage to animals, you could cut down on blood vessel growth within their body. OK, but does that translate out to stopping the growth and spread of cancer? 
Apparently not, as none of the shark cartilage doses tested had any retarding effect on cancer growth or spread in tumor-bearing mice. But just because it doesn't work in rodents doesn't mean it doesn't work in humans. To find that out, you need to put it to the test. Evaluating shark cartilage in human cancer patients When it comes to marketing unproven cancer treatments, the Internet has become the Wild West. Fraudsters are able to take advantage of people like never before. Cancer patients find quackery on the web, bemoaned the National Cancer Institute. Did you know there were more than 200,000 documents about cancer on the web? What? When was this published? Oh, 1996. <laughs> That's just a few years after the web was born. Not to worry, though, said the author of Dr. Linden's Guide to Online Medicine. It takes a lot of time and money to maintain a web page, so don't worry. The massive information on the Internet will dwindle during the next few years as the Internet matures. Right. Yes, dwindling from 200,000 down to a mere quarter of a billion. And one of the most commonly recommended quote-unquote alternative cancer cures on popular websites is shark cartilage. Much has been made in recent years of the mystical aura afforded to the stuff. Clearly, part of it is the visceral fear of cancer, combined with a healthy respect for a creature that has survived basically unchanged since prehistoric times. It has been reported that sharks rarely get cancer, and their skeleton is made out of cartilage, and so logic has led some to believe that this must be the reason for sharks' relative health. Not exactly sure that's logical, but they do have a lot of cartilage. Cartilage in general has few blood vessels, and blood vessels are important for cancer growth, and all this conspired to prime fraught cancer patients for shameful exploitation by pseudoscience and the supplement industry with the addition of just one myth, and that's sharks don't get cancer. But they do get cancer after all. Just another layer of fallacious arguments, successfully convincing desperate cancer patients to buy ineffective products. But wait, you don't know if it's ineffective until you put it to the test. 60 patients with a variety of advanced cancers given like a dozen scoops a day of shark cartilage, and not a single, even partial, response was noted in any of their tumors. Ineffective, with no salutary effect on the quality of life, in fact suffering significant gastrointestinal toxicity from the stuff, all the while the tumors progressed in all the patients. So what's missing from this survival graph? What happened in the control group? There was no control group. So while this is what you'd expect to see in advanced cancer patients, how do we know the cancers wouldn't have progressed even faster without the shark cartilage? That's why we need randomized controlled trials, but there weren't any until the Mayo Clinic stepped up. A randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind clinical trial for patients with incurable breast or colorectal carcinoma. Data on a total of 83 patients was analyzed, and there was no difference in survival between patients getting shark cartilage versus those getting placebo, nor any suggestion of improvement in quality of life, there was evidently a prostate cancer study, too. Only five patients were even able to complete the study, and in all five, their cancers continued to progress unabated. So unfortunately, the claims for benefits of shark cartilage are completely unsubstantiated by any objective data from controlled clinical trials. Not so fast, said supplement manufacturers. Maybe these crude commercial shark cartilage powders just don't have high enough levels of whatever active components there may be, so cancer patients should instead be taking shark cartilage extract pills. So the National Cancer Institute said, fine, we'll test that too, just to make absolutely sure, and so they funded a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial to put it to the test. Unlike the other shark cartilage dietary supplement studies, they used the purified extract, and the study outcome was unambiguous. It failed. 
The shark cartilage group lived 14 months, and the placebo group lived 15 months, so no significant difference in survival, or to time of progression, or tumor response rate. So these clinical studies suggest shark cartilage is not just an unproven cancer remedy, but actually a well-disproven one. Yet despite the overwhelming evidence to the contrary, such claims persisted. Uh, for example, the huckster who started it all wrote a sequel, Sharks Still Don't Get Cancer. Uh, perhaps the only cure for this myth is to spread the rumor that cartilage from the noses of such quacks fights cancer too. Anyway, if you really want to eat angiogenesis inhibitors, why sit down to a bowl of cartilage powder when you could just eat an apple, or drink green tea, or turmeric, or pomegranates, berries and nuts, soybeans, flax seeds, broccoli, all of which have been shown to have anti-angiogenic effects? About one in four women will eventually suffer from fibroids, uh, most commonly manifesting as excessively heavy periods and pain or pressure. Why might you feel pressure? Because you may be carrying around 26 pounds of tumors in your uterus. Fibroids are the most common reason women get hysterectomies, having their uterus removed completely, a major surgery associated with disability and death. But all surgery carries risk. I mean, the chances of dying within a month of surgery may only be about 1 in 1,200, which makes it among our safest surgeries, safer than getting your gallbladder removed, for example. But of course, you lose the ability to bear children, and costs billions of dollars a year. Yet despite the high prevalence, significant pain and suffering, and huge economic impact, relatively little is understood about the cause and disease process that lead to fibroid tumors. Avoiding atomic bomb blasts whenever you can is probably a good idea in terms of decreasing fibroids' risk. But what about more easily modifiable risk factors? Well, alcohol consumption is associated with increased risk, particularly beer. And whenever you hear that, whenever you hear beer specifically, you think of the hormonal effects specific to beer, specifically the, the powerful phytoestrogen found in hops. Well, if that phytoestrogen is increasing fibroids risk, what about the phytoestrogens in soy? Well, this was looked at in the Black Women's Health Study. Uh, fibroids are two to three times more prevalent among African American women, so they thought maybe dairy intake might be contributing to the disparity, uh, given their higher levels of lactose intolerance. And indeed, dairy consumption was associated with reduced risk. Uh, they figured it was the calcium content, or maybe the vitamin D, but uh, perhaps the women were drinking soy milk instead, and that was increasing their risk? No, uh, soy intake was found to be unrelated. The same finding in a group of predominantly white women, uh, though they did note a protective association with the amount of lignans flowing through their bodies. Uh, lignans are another class of phytoestrogens found predominantly in flax seeds, uh, but throughout the plant kingdom. Hard to make any generalizations about soy phytoestrogens, though, as soy consumption was rather low across the board. This was done in Washington state. If you go to Japan, where they have the highest per capita soy consumption in the world, you could get a bigger spread of intakes. Uh, the researchers had previously found that soy intake was inversely associated with the risk of hysterectomy, meaning women who ate more soy had lower hysterectomy rates, suggesting a potentially protective effect of soy against uterine fibroids, since that's the main reason women have their uterus removed. Uh, this would be consistent with in vitro studies that found that the main soy phytoestrogen seemed to inhibit fibroid tissue proliferation in a petri dish. But when they specifically looked, there was no evidence of a link to soy at all, protective or otherwise. Uh, the same was found in one study out of China. Fruit and vegetable intake was associated with significantly lower risk of fibroids, but soy food consumption was not. But a second study out of China, published the same year, found a significant association between soy milk intake and fibroids. That's consistent with the three alarming case reports of women with symptomatic fibroids reporting an unusually high intake of soy milk, or regularly consuming excessive amounts of soy, or extremely high intakes of soy every day for decades. It's hard to take these cases seriously when nowhere do they actually say how much they were consuming. Uh, the only quantitative mention was 40 grams of isoflavones, which roughly translates to 400 gallons of soy milk every day. 
That would be excessive, but also impossible. The only way to know for sure is to put it to the test, not just a population study or anecdotal reports, but randomize women to two years of soy phytoestrogens, the amount found in three to five cups of soy milk a day, and no significant effect on the frequency or growth of fibroids was found. Household cleaning products can be hazardous, landing hundreds of thousands of children in U.S. emergency rooms. And the product most commonly associated with injury was bleach, which can be toxic even if used as directed. We've known that those with asthma who work with cleaning products day in and day out can suffer adverse respiratory effects, a worsening of symptoms, a decline in lung function, inflamed airways. But even cleaning workers without asthma can be affected. Even below so-called acceptable exposure levels, cleaners with or without reactive airways can suffer a substantial decrease in lung function. OK, but that's people who clean for a living. Although we've known that occupational use of bleach may have adverse respiratory health effects, but it was unknown whether just common domestic use of bleach in the household may put lungs at risk until now. Bleach use was significantly associated with nearly five times the odds of non-allergic adult-onset asthma, as well as ongoing lower respiratory symptoms such as chronic cough. The way bleach works is as such a strong prooxidant that the thought is that it can lead to like leaky lungs and allow allergens to penetrate. This phenomenon of cleaning product-induced asthma has been known for decades. Uh, more than three-quarters of the dozens of population studies looking into it have found increased risk of asthma or nasal inflammation. Ideally, safer cleaning products should be available. Unfortunately, this body of evidence has been largely ignored by the manufacturers and commercial cleaning companies, and most of workers put at risk are women. In fact, that may help explain some of the gender differences in asthma. The relatively high frequency of bleach use for home cleaning by women around the world, together with the strong association between bleach use and non-allergic asthma, emphasizes the need for reconsidering the use of bleach for cleaning. There are natural, environmentally friendly cleaning products that may offer a safer alternative. Uh, safer, perhaps, but are they as effective? We didn't know. Until now, the effectiveness of three home products in cleaning and disinfection of Staphylococcus aureus, the bacteria that causes staph infections, and E. coli on home environmental surfaces. The first report ever of the performance of purportedly safer alternatives. In the home setting, some individuals will select conventional products such as bleach due to familiarity. It's a smell some associate with cleanliness. Others are seeking less hazardous and environmentally preferable green, organic, or natural disinfectants, which you can buy or make yourself, so-called DIY, do-it-yourself recipes that typically involve ingredients like vinegar, club soda, and plant essential oils such as tea tree oil, prized for its antimicrobial qualities. So, Researchers pitted head-to-head -head Clorox bleach versus a natural disinfectant based on thymol, which is from thyme essential oil, versus a DIY recipe, half club soda, half white vinegar, with a few drops of tea tree oil. Uh, you could probably buy the bleach for around 3 bucks, the natural stuff for more like $7, but the DIY mix for less than a dollar. Yeah, but does it work? On the bottle, it says bleach can kill 99.9% .9 of germs, which is the EPA standard for the disinfection of surfaces that don't come into contact with food, like the bathroom sink or something. They claim 99% of germs, but when put to the test, the bleach actually killed 99.9999% of germs, completely wiping out the E. coli and staph germs, which even exceeds the EPA standard for food contact surfaces, like the kitchen counter. and so did the expensive natural stuff. Worked just as well as the bleach. But the club soda vinegar tea tree oil concoction flopped, allowing as many as a few percent of the staff bugs to thrive. Now, maybe they didn't use enough of the tea tree oil, only adding about a drop per cup, but from a 
performance perspective, the environmentally preferable product is an effective alternative to conventional bleach. And I would say even better, since bleach is well known as a respiratory irritant, and it's corrosive too, and may end up damaging surfaces. Uh, what I would find interesting is to test how effective a cheap DIY thyme oil solution would be. So far, I've reviewed the evidence on coconut oil and coconut milk. Uh, that suggests neither is good for you, but what about coconut water? When I first learned about athletes using coconut water as like natural Gatorade, I did a medical literature search for athletes and coconut, and only came up with this, a study of canine athletes. Turns out uh, feeding like drug or bomb sniffing dogs coconut oil can sometimes wipe out their ability to smell at all. Uh, but what about coconut water and human athletes? Studies on coconut water as an electrolyte replacement beverage date back decades when coconut water was compared to other beverages and found to be more suitable, but the other beverages they compared it to were like Pepsi, Coke, Sprite, and 7-Up. You don't really know until you put it to the test. It was found to help in cases of mild dehydration due to childhood diarrhea, despite having an unbalanced electrolyte composition, by which they meant the sodium-potassium ratio was off. Uh, coconut water has so much potassium that people with kidney disease can run into life-threatening hyperkalemia, too much potassium in the blood. If you drink like two quarts of coconut water and don't have normal kidney function, which would otherwise just flush the excess away, uh, people may not realize coconut water has so much potassium. So even if your doctor warns you about staying away from high-potassium foods, you know, you may not realize and run into problems. Even one quart a day may be too much for someone whose kidneys have been compromised by diabetes, for example. Cream of tartar is the same kind of thing. People don't realize it's like 20% pure potassium, and so when they listen to websites claiming it's some natural remedy, even young people with healthy kidneys can run into problems if they take spoonfuls of the stuff, with cream of tartar overdose deaths dating back to the 1800s. But what about rehydration after exercise with fresh young coconut water? Yes, it can help replace fluid loss from diarrhea, but what about fluid loss from heavy exercise? We didn't know until this study. 90 minutes at about 90 degrees Fahrenheit until they lost up to 3% of their body weight, and then they had them drink coconut water versus a sports beverage versus just plain water, and no significant difference in rehydration for any of them. Subsequent study findings were more mixed. Some showed a sports drink beat out water for hydration, but coconut water didn't, or they both beat out water but not each other. But the reason athletes care about rehydration is that they care about performance. But there had never been any studies on not just measures of hydration, but on physical performance until this study. They tested water versus coconut water, versus coconut water from concentrate, versus a standard sports drink. Then they stuck them on a treadmill and timed how long they could go before they collapsed, and they discovered no significant difference between any of them. Plain water did just as good as coconut water. In fact, even better, since those drinking the coconut water felt more bloated, with upset tummies. Now, this was all done at room temperature, about 70 degrees. What about instead at over 90 degrees Fahrenheit? Then the coconut water did seem to beat out water, but time to exhaustion isn't the same as performance. I mean, that's something that's routinely used in laboratory studies, but doing something like a time trial test would actually measure speed and performance. But there's never been a head-to-head -head water versus coconut water time trial until now. Drinking coconut water, bikers make it 10K in 971 seconds, and on plain water, about 5 seconds faster. In other words, no significant difference. The first study on the use of coconut water during exercise, and it looks like it's no more beneficial than plain water. How's the coconut water industry going to spin this? They're the ones that funded the study that found no difference between plain water, coconut water, and sports drinks. So did the authors conclude, you know, Vita Coco is no better than water? No. They said coconut water is just as good as sports beverages. 
a finding athletes and coaches will likely find of most importance, failing to note that not only did plain water do just as well, it did better because there were twice as much stomach upset in the coconut water groups. Uh, but wait, if all the beverages did equally well, then this isn't just a refutation of any special properties to coconut water, but the sports drinks as well. If they did no better than water, are sports drinks just a waste of money? If you had to name the greatest medical advance of the past two centuries, what would you pick? Smallpox vaccine jumped to my mind until I realized it was discovered back in the 1700s. The British Medical Journal compiled a list of 15 contenders, but which would take the crown? Would it be anesthesia? Kind of nice to be asleep during surgery. Would it be antibiotics? One of the 15 may be surprising. The medical marvel that was water with sugar and salt. The discovery that sugar and salt were absorbed together in the small intestine was potentially the most important medical advance of the century because it opened the way to oral rehydration therapy, which is to say simple packets of sugar and salt in the right ratio that could be added to water to save the lives of children losing electrolytes through severe diarrhea from diseases like cholera. I mean, here we just hook you up to an IV, give you intravenous rehydration therapy, but cheap, easy oral rehydration saved millions and millions of children's lives every year, such that UNICEF uh, can now put out reports like this to help finish the job. It only costs pennies, though. If only there was a way to sell salty sugar water for two bucks a bottle. Sports drinks are a multi-billion dollar industry fueled by Coke and Pepsi, and even drug companies are now getting in on the action. Researchers went online to see what kind of hydration advice people were getting. Pop quiz, true or false? Fluid consumption during exercise should be based upon thirst. Is that a true or false statement? Fluid consumption during exercise should be based on thirst. Get a piece of paper, write down your answer. All right, ready? Next question. Electrolyte intake is not generally necessary during exercise. Keeping score, true or false. Dehydration is not generally a cause of exercise-associated muscle cramping. And last one, exercise-associated muscle cramping is not generally related to electrolyte loss. And the answers are true, 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 and true. If you said false to any of them, you're wrong but in good company. 93% of top websites got the first question wrong, 90% got the second question wrong, 98% got the third question wrong, and they all got the last one wrong. And to make matters worse, those websites that would generally be perceived as being more trustworthy by the public, like medical or professional organizations, appeared to do no better. So you shouldn't feel bad if you got any wrong. No wonder athletes often have misunderstandings about proper hydration during exercise. Doesn't dehydration hurt performance? Surprisingly, when they looked at triathletes, they didn't see a correlation between dehydration and marathon finishing times. In fact, some that lost the most water actually had among the fastest times, as has been noted in other studies. Your body's not stupid. It will tell you when you need to drink. There's now ample evidence that we can just drink to thirst, and you do not have to drink your electrolytes. Uh, but wait, if you're sweating and just drink pure water, aren't you risking washing out too much salt, too much sodium, and ending up with exercise-associated hyponatremia, too little sodium? That's caused by drinking too much of anything, water or sports drinks. One of the high-profile cases of a high school athlete who died from it drank two gallons of Gatorade. So how do we prevent such deaths? Simple. We drink according to thirst. So these you know, don't wait until you feel thirsty statements you hear may actually be doing more harm than good. We've known this since the early 90s, but it was ignored. 
the American College of Sports Medicine instead started telling athletes they should drink as much as tolerable during exercise, and what followed was an epidemic of cases of hyponatremia. Commercial interests may have played a role in delaying the acknowledgement of these findings for decades. Now, the current ACSM statement no longer says that, in fact, emphasizing how dangerous it can be to drink too much. But they still plug sports beverages as sometimes preferable to water. Hmm, I wonder who these authors are. Funding received from the Gatorade Sports Science Institute, or on the Gatorade Sports Science Institute Speakers Bureau, Gatorade Science Institute, more Gatorade, a quick step over to the Coca-Cola company, and then back to Gatorade. So anyways, which of the 15 medical marvels won, by the way? Was it oral rehydration to prevent deaths from cholera, or antibiotics to kill off the cholera bugs? No. Our greatest medical miracle over the last two centuries was sanitation, preventing the cholera from getting into our drinking water in the first place. A great deal is asked of our immune system. On one hand, it has to respond rapidly and violently to invaders, but at the same time uh, limits both the response and the collateral damage to the host. Anaphylactic shock, like when someone with a peanut allergy dropped dead after eating a peanut, is an example of an overactive immune response. The flip side is an underactive immune response, which can put you at risk for infection. Uh, if you suffer some severe trauma, for example, it's not enough to get to a level 1 trauma center. Death related to sepsis, blood infection, is still a major problem. And a major factor is the depression of our immune system uh, caused by the stress of the trauma. So what these researchers did was to try to stimulate immune function in trauma victims by injecting them with beta-glucan, a type of fiber found in yeast, uh, mostly car crash victims, but also gunshots and stab wounds. And not only did the beta-glucan group suffer less sepsis overall, they have five times fewer complications and no deaths, compared to nearly one in three dying in the control group. I've talked about the role of oral beta-glucans in the form of nutritional yeast to boost immune function in adults and children. But if it's so immunostimulatory, then might it increase inflammation, worsen allergies? Actually, dietary yeast may offer the best of both worlds, possessing both anti-inflammatory as well as antimicrobial activities. On one hand, activating the immune system to prevent infections. On the other hand, capable of reducing inflammatory reactions. Given their best-of-both-worlds nature, enhancing immune defense while simultaneously down-regulating inflammations, beta-glucans are suggested as a replacement for immunosuppressant drugs to treat inflammatory diseases like inflammatory bowel disease. Turns out that's a bad idea for Crohn's disease, since it can make things worse. Same with another disease called the hydradenitis suppurativa. But what about allergies like hay fever? Uh, they did a nasal provocation test with tree pollen, and then siphoned off some mucus, and those that had been taking beta-glucans had lower levels of some inflammatory compounds, or should I say inflammatory compounds. <clears throat> and based on just that, they suggested it might help people with hay fever, but you don't know until you put it to the test. A randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind study compared the effects of daily supplementation for a month with about a teaspoon of nutritional yeast worth of beta-glucans versus placebo on the physical and psychological health of self-described moderate uh, ragweed allergy sufferers. Uh, the ragweed family is one of the leading causes of hay fever, and give people a placebo and nothing much happens. But in the beta-glucan group, a significant drop in symptoms and symptom severity fewer runny noses, fewer itchy eyes, and fewer sleep problems. So no wonder less tension, depression, anger, fatigue, and confusion, and more vigor. So improved allergy symptoms, overall physical health, and emotional well-being with the beta-glucans found in a single teaspoon of nutritional yeast, uh, which would cost about five cents a day. LDL bad cholesterol is bad, but oxidized LDL may be worse. What role might our diet play? 
Increased fruit and vegetable consumption has been reported to reduce the risk of developing cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, and strokes. Well, maybe it's in part because of all the antioxidants in healthy plant foods preventing the oxidation of LDL cholesterol. And indeed, the LDL oxidation resistance was found to be greatest among those eating more plant-based. So that would be in addition to the decreased blood pressure and lower LDL overall in terms of beneficial effects. But you don't know if it's cause and effect until you put it to the test. Put people on a whole food plant-based diet for just three weeks, and rates and extent of LDL oxidation drop. The effects of kale on LDL oxidation was put to the test. Kale is a best-of-all-worlds food, low in calories, packed to the hilt with nutrition, vitamins, minerals, anti-inflammatory compounds, antioxidant, phytonutrients, you name it. No surprise, then, given its high antioxidant capacity, kale showed a protective effect on the oxidation of LDL, even at low concentrations. But this was in vitro, in a test tube. Kale was also put to the test in mice, but what about people? I did a video on this study on how kale juice improves coronary artery disease risk factors in men with high cholesterol. Extraordinary results, a 20% drop in LDL among the non-smokers, but they were drinking the equivalent of about 10 cups of kale a day. Still, the, the fact that they were able to see an improvement, even though nearly all the fiber was removed, because uh, it was just juice, um, shows there does seem to be something special in the plant. But can you get the benefit just eating the stuff? Let's find out. The effects of black and red cabbage on oxidized LDL. And by black cabbage, they mean lacinato kale, also known as dinosaur or Tuscan kale. Uh, they had people eat a bag of frozen kale and cabbage a day for just two weeks, which is you know, it's great, because you, know, you just keep it in the freezer, pre-washed, pre-chopped, just throw into any meal you're making, and got significant reductions of total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and even blood sugar levels, and the antioxidant capacity of their blood went up, and so no surprise, they demonstrated significant decrease in oxidized LDL2. Would it have been better to take that red cabbage and ferment it into sauerkraut? Red or purple cabbage, one of my favorite vegetables, packed with antioxidants, yet dirt cheap and seems to last forever in the fridge. And it's pretty and juicy and tasty. I try to slice shreds off in any meal I'm making. But when you ferment it, not only do you add way too much salt, but you end up wiping out some of the nutrition. Here's the big spike in antioxidant capacity of your bloodstream in the hours after eating fresh red cabbage. Cut down by almost 30% if you ate the same amount in fermented form. Does cabbage have to be raw, though? No, some cooking techniques may improve the antioxidant activity in kale and red cabbage. The effects of the cooking process can be positive, since cooking softens the vegetable tissues, helping your body extract the active compounds. However, cooking can also be negative, because heat treatment can degrade some of the compounds. They looked at a variety of different cooking methods, and concluded steaming may be considered the best home cooking technique to prepare kale and red cabbage. But with foods that healthy, the truly best way to prepare them is whatever way will get you to eat the most of them. The first issues of the first scientific journals were published back in 1665, in which it was noted things like, hey, it looks like there's a spot on Jupiter, uh, thanks to new telescopes invented by a certain Mr. Newton whose friend Halley described a comet. The same journal that reported that oranges and lemons could cure scurvy, and something in willow tree bark could bring down a fever. Also published a, a letter by some guy over in the colonies about playing with kites during lightning storms, an account of a remarkable eight-year-old musician by the name of Amadeus. And within this last century, some sketchings of the structure of some molecule called DNA, a journal still in publication to this day 350 years later, available now online and in print for the low, low subscription price of only $6,666 a year. 
As you can imagine, the high price of journals leaves doctors in developing countries missing out on relevant information about health. At that time, back in the 90s, there was optimism that by 2004 at least, the problem of access to life-saving scientific information would be solved. But 2004 came and went, setting their sights for 2015. Surely by then we can achieve health information for all, as lack of access remained a major barrier. Realistically, only scientists at really big, well-funded universities in the developed world may have full access to published research. And as prices rise even higher, even that may no longer be true. You know there's a problem when even Harvard, as in $30 billion endowment Harvard, claims that costs for research journals are now prohibitive. Meanwhile, the journal publishers are raking in billions, charging institutions up to $35,000 a year per journal, and charging individuals online per article. So uh, you have a family member diagnosed with some disease, and you go online. You can read all sorts of internet direct, but if you want to see the actual science, it can get expensive. And you likely paid for the research. Tax dollars pour in to fund the research, and then you can't get access to the research you paid for. It's like if a nice little city park was built, but then some private firm came in and started to charge admission. That's roughly how it works with scientific research. And this conversion of public research dollars into private publishing profits has long been a source of discontent. Uh, the publishers don't end up paying anything for the research. They get it for free. They don't pay the researchers anything. So we pay for it, and then we have to pay for it again if we want to read it. Uh, so it can end up with science as a profit system rather than it's science as knowledge. Enter Alexandra Elbakan, nicknamed by some the Robin Hood of science. It's the story of how one researcher made nearly every scientific paper ever published available for free to everyone anywhere in the world. Named by perhaps the most prestigious scientific journal in the world as one of the top 10 people who mattered the most in science in 2016, Alexandra started out as just a frustrated grad student in Kazakhstan, uh, unable to access the scholarly papers she needed for her research. Once she figured out how to circumvent all the paywalls, she started a website, now at sci-hub.io, to remove all barriers in the way of science by giving away the world's scientific, medical, and nutrition literature for free. What she did is nothing short of Awesome, said one researcher. Lack of access to scientific literature is a massive injustice, and she fixed it with one fell swoop. Alexandra Elbakan, a 20-something-year-old grad student, is operating a free, searchable online database of nearly 50 million stolen scholarly journal articles, shattering the $10 billion per year paywall of academic publishers, an awe-inspiring act of altruism, or a massive criminal enterprise, depending on who you ask. Now up to 60 million papers, providing access to nearly all scholarly literature via its websites sci-hub.cc, sci-hub.io, and sci-hub.ac. SciHub was able to fill 99.3% of article requests, all for free. A sister site, uh, Library Genesis at uh, libgen.io, distributes scientific books and textbooks for free, more than a million of them, also illegally. Who's downloading pirated papers? Everyone concluded this feature in prestigious journal Science. A survey of potential users suggests for most it's not some grand political statement, but rather that's the only way they have access, or feel it's just so much quicker and easier. Even those who have legitimate institutional access may still choose to use Sci-Hub, uh, because there's just so many fewer hoops to jump through. So you can imagine how sites like Sci-Hub may be filling publishers that charge for access with roaring existential panic, and they're not taking it lying down. Elsevier, the largest publisher, notorious for demanding researchers take down free copies of their own work, 
sued Sci-Hub, the Library Genesis Project, Alexandra, and 99 John Doe's for copyright infringement, a willful disregard of Elsevier's rights. Kind of hard to take the moral high ground, though, when you're effectively an international arms dealer. Can you imagine a tobacco company publishing health journals? Uh, surely the company's business mission would be impossibly confused. Would the company be in the business of killing people or keeping them alive? But if you can't imagine that absurdity, well, welcome to Elsevier, which in addition to publishing medical journals is also involved in the global arms trade, running arms fairs where things like cluster bombs are sold leading to medical journal editorial boards calling for a boycott of Elsevier's warmongering, health-damaging business practices. In response to the lawsuit, Alexandra wrote a letter to the judge. She wanted to make it clear that not only did Elsevier not create those papers, but that they don't pay researchers a penny, so it's not like a pirated movie or song where the content creator is losing out, uh, noting that no researcher had ever complained that she was handing out their research. In fact, scientific authors are typically thrilled when their work gets more out into the world. That's the whole point of science, to be shared and built upon. And one fell swoop, Alexandra created a portal likely offering a greater level of access to science than any institution on Earth in history, literally opening up a world of knowledge. And she's not backing down. Citing in her defense Article 27 of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights that everyone should have the right to freely participate in the cultural life of a community, including sharing in scientific advancement and its benefits. She realized that she could be arrested and extradited to the U.S. to face charges. She's fully aware that another computer prodigy turned advocate, Aaron Schwartz, was arrested on similar charges after mass downloading academic papers. Facing devastating financial penalties and jail time, Schwartz hanged himself. A single serving of blueberries can help mediate the arterial dysfunction induced by smoking a cigarette they investigated the effect of a single serving of frozen blueberries on young smokers. Smoke a single cigarette, and the ability of your arteries to relax naturally drops 25% within two hours. But eat two cups of blueberries 100 minutes before, and that same cigarette causes less than half the damage, demonstrating that a single big serving of frozen blueberries could counteract the artery dysfunction induced by smoking. Uh, however, of course, it should be noted that blueberry consumption cannot be considered a means of preventing health consequences due to smoking. This can only be realized by stopping smoking, or even better, not smoking in the first place. Two cups of blueberries is a lot, though. Yeah, you could easily chug those down in a smoothie, but what's like the minimum dose? We didn't know until a group of British researchers decided to put it to the test. To enable them to do a double-blind study, they had to create a placebo-controlled fake blueberry drink, so they used a freeze-dried wild blueberry powder to give people the equivalent of three-quarters of a cup of fresh blueberries, one and a half cups, one and three-quarters, uh, about three cups or four cups. They concluded blueberry intake acutely improves artery function in an intake-dependent manner. OK, so what's the optimal intake? After the placebo, nothing happens. But after eating one and three quarters cups worth of blueberries, a big spike in artery function improvement within just one hour of consumption. And that seems to be where the effect maxes out. Less than a cup is good, but between one and two cups seems better, with no benefit going beyond that in a single meal. Can you cook them? Uh, like what if you put them in a blueberry pie or something, the same remarkable improvement in artery function baked into a bun, uh, just spiking an hour later since solid food passes more slowly through your stomach. And then if you eat blueberries week after week, you get chronic benefits too in terms of reduced artery stiffness and a boost in your natural killer cells, which are one of your body's natural first lines of defense against viral infections and cancer. Uh, but wait a second, how can blueberries have all these amazing effects if the anthocyanins, the blue pigments in blueberries, purported to be the active ingredients, hardly even make it into our system. Women were given more than a cup of blueberries to eat, and they couldn't find hardly any in their bloodstream or flowing through her urine. 
Here's what's called a chromatogram, uh, with the spikes showing all the little anthocyanin peaks and blueberries. Here's your blood before eating blueberries. Obviously, no signs of the pigments. After one hour, you start to see them appear, and a few hours later they become a bit more distinct. But all in all, just a few billionths of a gram per milliliter show up. So either anthocyanins are extremely potent, and therefore active at low parts per billion blood concentrations, or somehow their bioavailability has been underestimated. So researchers decided to radioactively tag them and trace them throughout the body. What happens is that blueberry pigments are metabolized by our liver in our microbiome, the good bacteria in our gut, into these active metabolites that are then what's absorbed into our system. So it's kind of a team effort to benefit from berries. And that would solve this mystery as well. Anyone notice this second spike in benefit over here at six hours? How does that make sense? Well, some of the metabolites peak in the bloodstream within an hour, but others ramp up more slowly, especially if the berries have to make it all the way down to the colon. And it's not just spikes at one hour and six hours. If you track them out even further, some go up even more. So like a day later, you may still be experiencing berry benefits as our gut bacteria continues to churn out goodies that get absorbed back into our system, feeding us as we feed them. Eating blueberries can so feed our good bacteria that it's like taking a natural probiotic, a win-win all around.